Um, I hope to not use all of the 15 minutes that I've been allotted. I think it would be good to have some time for a discussion a bit later. Uh, and it's been a real pleasure to read the papers for this session. Uh, so this is, I don't want to steal their thunder, but this is just a quick summary of what we're going to um, be covering in the presentations. So on US data about Facebook, we have a model that's looking to account for a very wide range of welfare impacts from economies of scale to the both profitability, but also consumer disutility of advertising to market power. And the question the paper addresses is, what's the optimal policy in this case, uh, allocating all of the ad revenues to users, uh, building on the data as labor approach um, uh, to uh, digital advertising and data collection. We've got a paper using French data, looking at the influence of Twitter on the production of news. How do news media of the conventional kind respond to popular posts online, both in terms of their editorial decisions, also economically in terms of their investments? Uh, we have a paper on Hong Kong data, looking at posts and comments on online news um, uh, sites. What does that allow us to infer about conflicting viewpoints? And the short answer is that either people are in their filter bubbles and interact with each other, or there are fights. And I particularly liked in this paper the idea that there was such a thing as real bots compared to people who only comment once. Very nice approach using different styles of language to distinguish attitudes. Then we have a paper on uh, French data again, looking at a French merger and considering the consequences of a merger of uh, a merge that went ahead, but the failure to look at that as a two-sided platform and the actual consumer detriment that came from keeping the ad sales houses uh, separated. And then from uh, David and myself, a paper on UK data, looking at um, estimates of consumer surplus uh, derived from these free, in terms of money, ad advertising funded goods, but also other kinds of free goods. The short answer being, that interpreting the welfare consequences is a bit complicated, as David is going to come on to talk about. So on the face of it, although these are all about media and social media in some way, they are quite disparate papers, um, different questions, different country data sets, but actually there are some common themes, which is what I wanted to highlight here. Uh, one is that I really want to celebrate uh, the empirics here, the use of new data sources, the creation of new data, and the um, uh, addressing empirical questions that arise from these um, social media and media platforms. In my view, we've had a, a very high ratio of theory to empirics in this domain. And I think it's great that we're getting a lot of empirical work being done now. They also have a common motivating question, which is what are the welfare consequences of digital platforms, especially the social media platforms? Uh, and this I think is profoundly important and I want to come back to in my last slide. And then there's a common theme about the linkage between welfare outcomes and the ad funded business models. So I won't read this out, but in, um, in the papers, this is um, very common. Um, Patrick mentioned my BBC experience. We did a lot of consumer research on behalf of licensee payers. And one of the uh, constant things that they, they said about why they appreciated the BBC so highly, and it was highly, is no adverts. So there's definitely um, consumer detriment from that. And some interesting results in Mark's paper that he might talk about, about the difference between adverts that compel your time because you're looking at them online or on screen and adverts on uh, paper in magazines and newspapers. There is an older literature about advertising and I don't know how many of you know this Nicky Caldor paper from um, 1950, where he uh, walked through in an informal way the welfare effects of the advertising industry and came out with a pretty negative conclusion. Uh, you know, he argued that advertising was a, a consequence of the market power around brands, as well as information provision, which is the general starting point in economics. Um, you might conclude now that we have digital advertising, which is a huge market, highly non-transparent, um, quite fraudulent, uh, with a lot of um, market power in the hands of Google and Facebook, as the fantastic CMA study uh, pointed out last year, that um, maybe we should revisit this kind of overview of, and perhaps not be as business model neutral as we have tended to be, certainly in, in competition policy. 
So um, just a final few thoughts about this. And one is the, the policy implications. And this is a domain where I think the empirical approaches are really important because policymakers want to know, is this a big deal or not? Should we be doing something? How urgently should, should we be doing it? And what are the most urgent things to tackle? One of the obvious areas is competition policy. I was on the Furman panel in the UK. Uh, we know that there have been a lot of policy reviews of competition policy, and now we're seeing that being put into action in different jurisdictions. So the lessons from the economic theory and empirics are being taken on board. I think one question I would have about that is whether it's sufficiently radical or not, but that's not today's uh, subject. There's the question about news quality and uh, the health of traditional news investment in, in journalism and the role of conspiracy theories and so on. And I think one of the things these papers open up is whether and to what extent in economic analysis, we need to encompass these kinds of consequences. So to take it a bit further, um, should we be worrying as economists about the consequences of anti-vax conspiracies running rife on social media now? Um, there's also, I think, a, a question of working as economists with political scientists, technologists, ethicists to address these bigger questions about the role of government, public service media, and a number of open questions that I think will come out through the presentations of the papers. Uh, so for example, one issue that uh, I've been thinking about is, should we take a lens on um, welfare through time use? Because one of the things that the digital technologies and social media are doing is, is dramatically changing the way that we allocate our time, both in work and in leisure. And um, a lot of questions about economic welfare generally, I think, taking externalities seriously, trying to put some empirics on those, trying to think about how do we uh, think about the very large individual consumer surplus um, that people derive from these goods with the societal costs that they seem to be imposing as well. And I would end with a plea for us as economists to start taking welfare economics seriously again, uh, including in the curriculum actually, um, I think we have to end the reservations that we've had as a profession about speaking to some very, very large public policy questions, some big normative issues facing our societies, which social media absolutely raise. And I think you could say about the classic economic uh, economist's approach to economic welfare is that it's been a bit naive, politically naive, consequentialist, a bit naive about behavioral issues, and um, integrating these very um, different range, wide range of implications that the social media have for our society. So I'm going to stop there. I really welcome these papers. I hope we can take welfare economics seriously in um, future work going forward. And I think the policy implications of the discussion that we'll be having will be large indeed. Um, but if I do have any minutes left, I want to save them for discussion later. So thank you very much. So thanks for that uh, great introduction and thank you for providing us this great opportunity of sharing this uh, most recent working paper with you. The title of the paper is called Anticipated Ideological Online Clash with a Good Political Bias. This paper is co-authored with my friend Mandy Hu. She is working at the Business School of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, there are two major political parties. One is called pro establishment Party. Sometimes people are also calling them pro beijing or pro-communist party. They are the ruling party and their opponent is called pro-democracy party. Ideologically, they are more toward the Western's democratic political systems. Two parties are competing to each other. In March, 2019, the HK government intended to pass a important law. The law is called anti-extradition law amendment bill that's immediately hurts the feeling of those supporters for the pro-democracy party. So they go on the street and they do a lot of protest. As you may see in the picture, during the protest, there are a lot of clashes between police and the civilian authors that makes the word police becomes the focal point of the ideological conflict between those two parties. Basically, pro-democracy citizens, they think the government has abused the power of the police, whereas the pro-establishment supporters, they support the government's use of police force to maintain the social public orders. And the discussion about police are ranging from offline to online, and that motivate us to write on this paper. 
We simply collect the data from Facebook's HK mainstream media's website. Our data covers one year from April 1st, 2019 to March 31, 2020. That includes more than 140,000 media reports from 44 media outlets. So we focus on studying those comments under each news report. There are in total around 40 million comments. The one interesting thing is that uh, almost all the comments in our data are provided in the use of a Chinese character. But there are two ways to write on Chinese character. As you may see here in the picture, this is the word in Chinese character meaning knowledge. On the left hand side, you see its expression under the usage of uh, simplified Chinese character. On the right hand side, you see its expression under the usage of uh, traditional Chinese character. The difference writing habits was due to the fact that the, the Chinese Communist Party party, they led a big reform called Chinese character simplification reforms during the 1950s. So as a result, those people living in the mainland of China, they used to use simplified Chinese character, whereas people living in Hong Kong, they were being educated since their childhood to use traditional Chinese character. Both people can understand each other, but this is a bit costly for those people to switch their writing habit. So different writing habits in our paper also represent the basic cultural and the regional uh, differences amongst those peoples. So in this paper, we mainly want to study what's the impact of number of populist comments on the number of anti-populist comments. Specifically, under our circumstance, the number of populist comments may generate some further externalities. Imagine that if on the platforms, the, the, the voice has been dominated by those populist comments, it may urge the government to use more police force to maintain the public order. And that may also enhance the risk of offline protest. So such cheating effect may deter still support democracy supporters the motivation of expression they're, they're feeling online. So we wanna check if there is a, such kind of a cheating effect and I'm going to show you the result. On the main side, uh, on the main hand, in the meantime, we also wanna explain so what are the factors that may intensify the online ideological conflicts. If we're pulling on the, all the comments together, we see that those words that have been most frequently used are like police support and black cops. Both words support and police usually and often appear in the same comments. And the black cops is a term that has a strong feeling of anti-police. That confirmed two things. The first thing is that, as we mentioned, the police is the focal point of this ideological conflict during the, the last year. The second is that those people who are supporting police and those people who anti-police are evenly matched online. So in the economic parts, we use the dynamic panel regression model to study the impact of populist comments on anti-police comments to check whether there is a cheating effect on people's uh, uh, willingness of express their demand for the Hong Kong's independence and autonomy. We, all, we also include the words that is the, the number of the comments including the word liberate Hong Kong because liberate Hong Kong is uh, considered as the slogan by those protesters and the poor democracy supporters during the last year that has been widely used uh, to deal with uh, the, the, the endogeneity issue, we propose a new set of instrument variables. And uh, later in the empirical part, we find those instruments variable, at least in our circumstance, perform pretty well. They pass all the tests related to the validate, validity of the, the instrument variables. The idea is to include the number of new active simplified Chinese users, as well as the number of uh, new dead simplified Chinese users. The idea is that those simplified Chinese users used to support police that uh, satisfy the relevant conditions. In the meantime, no users as they ask can check their this user's uh, uh, historical activity and their online trajectory. So that makes the exclusion restriction condition may also be validated in our circumstance. Let me just briefly summarize our estimation results. The IV estimation shows that for each one per police comments that we are going to lead to more than one anti-police comments. That is very important because so such kind of impact dispels the cheating effect and at least the more online demand for the autonomy. We also manually collect all the, the offline protests that happened in Hong Kong during the last year. And uh, we do the regression model. So we also show that there is a strong link between online uh, people's online expression for their demand for the HK's independence and autonomy and the frequency of the offline protest. Beside of that, we also have two interesting findings. The, sec the first thing is that when switching to those comments specifically focused on uh, provided by those uh, simplified Chinese users, it seems that it's intensified ideological conflict. We wanna explain why. The second is that uh, all the estimation results consistently shows that ORS estimation may underestimate the actual effect. So we do some further check. The first thing is that uh, we check uh, why this may intensify the ideological conflict. We find that so the ideological conflict might be intensified just mainly due to the use of different writing habits rather from those people who, who provide the comments 
that has a, who had different cultural background. So that indicates that the reform of uh, Chinese character simplification in the 90s led to a very long standing cultural bias and that intensified the ideological conflict that we observe today. And uh, the second thing is that we surprisingly find that many comments might be provided by those uh, people who are considered as uh, suspected boss. And the existence of those comments may weaken the intensity of the, the, the conflicts. So the last thing is related to the policy suggestions. We have two things to say. The first is related to the China's great firewall policy that has been a long time criticized by many people, saying that this policy basically deters people living in the mainland of China freely browse the foreign website. And actually we find that actually the effect of the policy is two-sided because on the other hand, it also can drastically weaken uh, the ideological conflict between China and the US countries like uh, uh, Western worlds like the, the, the US. The last thing is related to the water armies because many governments have the intensity to use online bots and the water armies to do the ideological propaganda. So we find that in terms of weakening the online conflicts, such kind of policy might be effective since we find that there's some evidence that shows that low quality water army may play down the conflict by diluting those uh, conflict generating conflict content and high quality water army that uh, interact more with other peoples. We play down the conflict by preaching people. So this is all about our results. Thank you for your attention. So while well, you're presenting already, so here we am. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present this joint work uh, with Diane. Um, here, we're gonna talk about free goods and economic welfare. I'm gonna to try to give you a brief overview of the, um, of the paper. Um, and I hope by the end of my eight minutes, you all go to the ESCO website and have a look at the actual uh, working paper. So let's get into it. So basically, our starting point is that um, I think we can all relate to that, not only um, uh, this year, but in general, that our personal and professional lives are increasingly um, moving online. So um, here's some facts about the UK, for example, around 90% of the population uh, do use the internet uh, regularly. More than 80% have a smartphone. Um, many people actually nowadays only access the internet uh, via mobile devices as opposed to um, uh, desktop computers. Um, now, this is important. So UK ad adults spend around three and a half hours on average on the internet um, every day and 70% of those uh, of this time on uh, mobile devices. Now, by the time of um, uh, the height of the lockdown, this has to increase to more than four hours um, a day per, uh, per adult um, on average in, in the UK. And um, as you know, that many uh, services that we use online, uh, some of them are listed here, Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, Instagram, or various Google uh, services, um, not Netflix, of course, um, are, but the others are mainly free um, to use in, in, in monetary terms. Uh, and that's going to be important when we think about uh, what's the consumer surplus and how well uh, do traditional measures of, um, of uh, consumer surplus do. Okay, um, the context for the study is simple. How do we measure the value of an increasing number of goods that are free at the point of use? Even though, as Diane pointed out earlier, we have a couple of uh, goods in here where you pay, uh, such as Spotify or Netflix and other services such as public parks where you don't uh, pay directly um, and those are offline and we trying to work out some of the comparisons here between um, on and offline goods um, as well. Of course, this is not a new question, valuations in the absence of market prices um, has, has been a question that's been around in the environment or culture um, and obviously there's, there's a large literature on all of, um, on all of those. Um, now, um, uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, um, Avi Collis, um, um, and, and Felix Agersev used these contingent valuation techniques then to find really large consumer surplus uh, from free digital products um, in, in a paper that published in 2019 and some subsequent um, studies and, and papers. And that's really our starting point for, for a lot that we'll be doing um, here. More broadly, we really try to think about um, this kind of spectrum of GDP and welfare and you know where, where are we with, with certain measures and how good um, how good are they? Do we need to think about um, creating new ones if GDP is increasingly uh, challenged by the digital um, economy? We're able to use the UK lockdown to assess the changes in these valuations because quite suddenly you could not use a lot of offline services and were forced to use 
to use online. Okay, we, conduct, uh, we conducted so far two waves of, of an online survey via YouGov. Around 10,000 individuals were asked um, in late February 20, uh, 2020. So that was before um, the lockdown um, in, in the UK and elsewhere, and quite at the beginning of, of the whole um, uh, pandemic. So in that sense, we're quite confident that our results are not really driven um, uh, by that, at least. And we can see quite significant changes. For example, if you repeated that 10 weeks later, um, that you know a lot of the usage has changed across different goods and digital goods and also the associated um, uh, valuations I'll get as I'll get to in in the next slide we're planning now to run the survey again a year on in in, in February 2021 so what we're doing here is we're asking um, around 30 willing to accept questions here's an example um, where we're asking people how much or what would be the minimal amount of money they'd be willing to accept um, to give up a certain digital um, good and uh, that there's a whole long list um, of those. And this is the example for, for Netflix. For example, we know of course that the consumer surplus will be higher than what people um, pay for it. We randomized the question order, we randomized time periods. So we randomly asked people to give up the good for one month or 12 months. So we can play around with, with some of those um, later on. Now, of course, we have 10,000 individuals, so we can kind of um, calculate the average willingness to accept um, for, uh, for our sample because our sample is uh, weighted by various characteristics to be representative of the UK um, adult population. Of course, it's important to point out that the um, adult population is only the adult online population. So um, as I mentioned in the beginning, around 10, 11% of the population is not online. So we need to think about um, how to um, account for those for now, I would say this is representative of the online uh, population. Now I've just picked out three examples of the 30 that we have. Um, the average valuation for Facebook is around 1,200, um, almost 1,300 pounds per year. Um, it's higher for public parks, it's almost 2,000 pounds. And for Google search or online search, it's more than 3,000 pounds a year. These are average figures. We know that some individuals have very high values. Um, if we then look at medians, they're obviously um, much lower. All of those are in high use. So um, around three quarters of the online populations um, and almost 100% um, in the terms of search will be using these. Now we can, we can use these obviously to plot some sort of um, demand curves and we can say, okay, if offered a certain amount of money, how many people are willing to, or what's the share of the population that will be willing to give up um, access and if we plot those um, uh, for all the willingness to accept thresholds that we have, then we get to these um, uh, demand curves. We can do the same um, in May, um, and we're going to do the same now in February 21 to kind of see how um, how the demand curves shift or tilt, and whether some, the demand for for some goods is becoming more or less um, elastic uh, or, or, or yeah, more or less elastic um, over time. And I think that's quite quite some interesting. Um, insights already here that I don't have time to go into. Okay, we can look at non-usage rates and valuations, and you can see um, there's, there's this kind of non-linear relationship between, um, you know, um, how much, um, how widely spread or in use a certain uh, good is and how, how high the valuation is. Um, in general, there's, a, there's a, in that case, because it's non-usage, it's a negative correlation, uh, but the important thing is it's non-linear, so we think there might be some sort of network um, effects at, at play here. Okay, I'm going to skip forward a little bit um, in interest of time. We have individual characteristics, so obviously we control um, and kind of work out different um, really interesting differences across um, age groups or um, gender and, and income and regions as well. All of those are in the paper. We look at the impact of COVID and kind of how that has changed. And then we found two issues here. One is time inconsistencies. Um, so one issue is that if you add up or if you multiply the monthly valuations by 12, you don't really get the annual valuations, which is an interesting thing um, to bear in mind. And we struggle with the budget constraints. So um, if you're not paying for something, what is the real budget constraint? And that has to be something around the value of time. So that's something that we're doing some, some further work on um, at, at the moment. So conclusion is that we think that these online servers are highly scalable. So actually they are a viable tool to, to elicit these changes in valuations. 
Um, it's easy to expand the categories, add and drop products, but generally the willingness to accept um, is very high um, and they also differ across socioeconomic groups. And I'm gonna stop here, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, our next speaker is uh, Seth uh, Benzel, uh, who will present uh, a joint work with Avinash Kroos on no less than how to govern Facebook. All, uh, all right, excellent. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, perfect. Excellent. Okay, so thank you to David for that excellent lead-in because um, what this paper does is really take those kind of willingness to accept offer demand curves that you guys estimate in your paper and Avi, my co-author, has estimated in the past and try to take those demand curves seriously and plug them into a structural model of Facebook. So let's see what happens when you do that. Um, so first off, we all know that we're kind of worried about monopoly power amongst these big firms. We think they have supply side economies of scale because of low marginal costs. And for digital platforms, we also think that they have demand side economies of scale because of these network effects that make the product more valuable as more people use it. Uh, people have talked about different ways of dealing with it. Um, Europe's talking about taxes of different kinds. Um, this data as labor idea suggests that maybe we should unionize users of these platforms and have them collectively bargain against Facebook for their share of the profits. Um, you can also imagine doing things to improve competition. Fiona Scott Morton and her call for interoperability is a big part of that. Maybe we need more competition in this space. And then some people say that the way you get competition is not so much by uh, interoperability and regulations, but just as splitting up these companies. And you can imagine a vertical split up where, for example, Facebook gets split up with an Instagram, which is a very, if you think of Instagram as being a different market, or you might imagine like a horizontal split up where we end up with two baby Facebooks, kind of like how Bell Telephone was broken up. Okay, so just because it's a short presentation, the result preview, in case I don't get to everything, we find that Facebook generates seven times as much social surplus uh, as it collects in ad revenues in the United States. Uh, that's the good news for Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, we also find that Facebook's market power lowers welfare by 4% versus perfect competition, but what matters, what counts in social welfare is actually gonna matter for that, right? What we're gonna find is, is that Facebook actually has a lower level of advertising versus what its kind of short-term profit maximizing strategy would be. And from that, we impute that they have a value for maintaining a large user base. And if you think that that value is from they're collecting data that's gonna help them make new projects in the future, that's good producer surplus that we should count. But if you think that valuing a large user base is more about a mode and deterring entry, then that value of a large user base is maybe something we shouldn't think about in social welfare. But I'm gonna, in these presentations, I'm gonna take the positive view. Um, taxes we find are going to be mostly instituted on Facebook, but a properly targeted tax can actually raise consumer surplus. And so that's going to be making raising taxes a pretty attractive um, solution to a redistribution problem, especially if you don't have a lot of domestic investors in your country. Uh, we find that network effect killing breakup would be disastrous, hurting producers and consumers. And then data as labor, this idea of rebating to customers some share of the value of the ads that they watch is win-win because we preserve the ads but we're also incentivizing people to use the platform and get the positive network effect. Okay, so what does the model look like? Again, don't have time for details. I encourage you to look at the video and watch the paper or vice versa. Uh, the two kind of types of agents in our model are the platform firm, which are try it's trying to maximize its objective function, which is profit, plus maybe also they value maintaining a large user base. And then you've got the consumers. The consumers have to make a decision about whether or not to use the product. The consumers are heterogeneous, which is why we call this a multi-sided platform, you know, building on Jean Tyrol and all that great stuff, because each different demographic group of used users or whichever group that Facebook is price discriminating at against is going to have create different network effects for every other side. Uh, grandmas are going to really love their grandkids being on the platform, uh, and maybe grandkids don't care as much about their grandmas being on the platform. Um, as well as differences in opportunity costs. And the differences in opportunity costs are gonna drive differences in those demand curves like we saw with, uh, in David and Diane's presentation. Um, so that's the model. In order to solve the model computationally, we solve it through a series of cascades. So we asked the question, suppose that Facebook were to raise the level of advertising on group number I, a group I, well, then people in group I are gonna use the platform somewhat less. 
And then everyone who likes people in group I are then going to use the platform somewhat less. And then so on and so on, you have in sort of an infinity of these cascades until the model reaches a new equilibrium and nobody wants to leave anymore. Practically, we find that the model kind of dampens out after about three or so cascades. Okay, so now calibrating the model for Facebook. Again, uh, similar to Diane and David, we're gonna go out there and do these online surveys. We're gonna estimate these online surveys for 12 different demographic groups and try to get a sense both of the sort of uh, overall demand curve for Facebook, the value that's coming from users of different types. So what, what kind of users do you care about being on Facebook? And then finally, people's disutility from advertising. And we also bring in other information from Facebook's ad API and their quarterly reports on basically revenues and disutilities. Okay. So this is our demand curve. This is very analogous to what you saw in the last presentation. Um, these three dots are the dots that are in our survey. So this is a 95% confidence interval. And again, it's a demand curve, is how many people stop using Facebook if you give them $20, $10, $50. And again, similarly to what you saw before, we find the median is gonna be less than the mean. So it's inframarginal value is gonna be very important in this setting. Um, this is the network and network effects. The size of the node here is the number of the initial users and the thickness of the line is the value. These are the most valuable connections. Like I say, grandmas really like grandkids, um, grandpas like middle-aged men and middle-aged women like being connected to older men. Grandmas get a lot of value from everyone, provide less out. Kids get less value from everyone, but provide a good amount out. So this is, heterogeneity is gonna be important for understanding how Facebook's gonna respond to different policies. So um, like I promised you, we were gonna simulate six different policies. Here are antitrust simulations. Um, these latter two represent two different kinds of breakups, a horizontal breakup, so we're left with two mini Facebooks, and then a vertical breakup where we take Instagram off of Facebook and we just sort of arbitrarily assume that that makes main Facebook quality about 5% worse off. As you can see, both of those policies are gonna reduce the amount of people on the platform and reduce quality and make people unhappy. Whereas perfect competition, if you're, we're, we're imagining what this represents is advertising coming to zero, but no killing of network effects, perhaps through Fiona Scott Morton's interoperability, we see that that would obviously kill Facebook's profits, but would increase consumer surplus significantly and lead to a boost in social welfare of about five percentage points, which is like a lot, given that we're talking about a lot of value going around here. Uh, but maybe tax and redistribution is the better set of policy tools to use. So we evaluate a 3% tax. And now remember, because Facebook has these two motivations, the large user base motivation and the profit motivation, if you tax their profit motive, they're actually going to substitute into their other motive, right? So that's the mechanism by which a tax on advertising revenues or corporate profits can actually enhance consumer welfare. Whereas a per capita tax, a tax on the number of users that raise the same amount of revenue would have the opposite effect. It would slightly lower the amount of users in social welfare as Facebook squeezes the most elastic users tighter. Whereas data is labor, this kind of a win-win, you can just pay users for viewing the ads. You can imagine a whole range of redistributions. This is an extreme case where everything was rebated and that has a big positive effect on social welfare, 30%. Um, finally, why just to tie this into current debates, why not tax Facebook if you have few or no domestic investors or innovators, right? Um, as France, if you, none of you are in, you know, own Facebook stock, and I'm telling you that you can tax Facebook and have no effect on consumer welfare, or even a positive effect on consumer welfare, why not do that? Well, Proposition 22 in California, very briefly, there was a law that was passed saying that Uber and Lyft had to basically give more benefits to their drivers. Uber and Lyft said, we will leave if you make us do that. There was a proposition and California backed down. So perhaps the ultimate limit on these taxes isn't social welfare, but just brinksmanship against these firms. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Call to action. We need more people collecting this data and building structural models. On, on this uh, encouragement, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, our uh, last speaker is Mark Ivaldi, who will present uh, some uh, joint work on with the Gizan uh, uh, on uh, trying to draw the lessons from a case on the uh, TV market for understanding platform mergers and and, uh, and, and sometimes unintended consequences of uh, some of the remedies that are sometimes used. Mark, the floor is all yours. Uh, do, you see, do you see my screen? 
Yeah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, this uh, joint uh, work uh, with uh, G. Kai Zhang uh, is based on uh, Helsinki. I think that uh, our paper is uh, complement to the last two one in the sense that uh, what we are going to uh, to try in, in some sense is uh, 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 also to to uh, uh, to have an evaluation of uh, the, the 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 value of a TV show. Uh, when uh, the only price is in fact a negative price uh, through advertising. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this work started uh, with, um, uh, with uh, a, decision, uh, a decision from the French authority. Uh, the, the French authority has approved the acquisition of uh, two small uh, TV channels by uh, the biggest uh, TV channel in France. Uh, but in the same time, it had imposed a remedy, that is to say to keep the advertising sales house separated. The advertising sales house on the, the part of the TV uh, uh, channel, uh, TV station, that is in charge uh, to sell a slot uh, of time to advertiser uh, for, for, their, for their advertising campaign. So, but basically, uh, the, the, the rationale uh, behind this decision is relatively uh, straightforward. On the broadcasting side, uh, there can be, uh, and there are, uh, cost efficiency in the sense that the free channels are going to share the same catalog of videos of TV shows. So that explains why the, uh, the authority has approved uh, the, the, the merger on this side. Uh, on the other side, if, they had, if the authority um, had approved uh, the, the, the merger of the advertising sales out, it will have reinforced the dominant position of the, of the biggest uh, uh, TV channel on the uh, advertising uh, uh, market in, in France. And, and so uh, uh, the remedy. Well, what we can say from, uh, from, from that is that... Um, uh, clearly, the, the two sides uh, have been treated uh, separately. Uh, at least, uh, we don't see in the decision uh, um, a relation between, uh, between the two, two decisions. And it's for this reason we, uh, uh, we thought it was interesting to, uh, to evaluate this decision because uh, it is indeed a very interesting uh, uh, market because on one side, uh, viewers watch uh, uh, TV shows for free and, and, and in some sense pay by receiving uh, flows of, uh, of ads. By the way, it is uh, very similar to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to looking for information uh, on, on the internet where you go to, uh, to Google to, uh, to find an information is, is for free, but, but you receive in the same time uh, advertising. And on the other side, indeed, there are uh, advertising generate uh, revenues to, uh, to, uh, to, the, to the platform. And, and as you know, the, the difficulty here, uh, the, the challenge is to understand uh, the, the, the relation between the two types of uh, externalities that uh, you can have here. We have positive externality of users on advertisers. Since it is uh, free, uh, free of charge to, uh, uh, to, to watch TV, of course, uh, uh, the, the, the more users, uh, the, the, uh, the, the higher the incentive to, to, to increase the quantity of uh, advertising. On the other side, it's not always uh, true, but in general, advertising is perceived as a negative externality. And so uh, there is an incentive to decrease the quantity of advertising. What is, what is, uh, uh, what is the equilibrium solution of this? A bit uh, that result from these two forces. It, it is uh, the basis of the structural analysis that we have tried to uh, to, to set up. So we, we uh, uh, it, it is not easy to uh, to get data on uh, on advertising. I mean, it's a, it's a real issue uh, to uh, to analyze all, all those markets. Uh, if we really uh, believe in. Uh, 
uh, in this type of model of uh, two-sided, we need uh, to have uh, data on both sides, and that's uh, that's uh, the, the the big uh, big challenge. So, so we have been able to get uh, monthly data from the period 2008-2013. Uh, it's monthly data. Maybe we we we, uh, we could uh, uh, prefer to uh, to have more disaggregated data uh, to to analyze more precisely the, the decision on broadcasting, for example. But anyway, uh, this is interesting because we have been able to observe uh, what happened after the merger that happened in in twenty uh, in two thousand ten. Uh, the, the data covers uh, the major uh, free broadcast TV uh, that uh, cover 90% of the total advertising uh, revenue in, in France. And uh, the, the free type of uh, information that we have and that I needed to, to, uh, uh, to analyze a, a model of supply and demand is that we have uh, an information on, uh, on the number of viewers uh, in terms of a weighted average of viewers per second in, in a month. And we have uh, an, inform uh, an information about the price uh, of uh, advertising uh, per second. We have also the quantity of, uh, of advertising. And then, which is important uh, for uh, uh, instrumental variable uh, information is uh, to, uh, we have the uh, data on the broadcasting content of each uh, TV channel uh, in, each, uh, in each month. Uh, a few words on, 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 the on the market structure. So uh, I already said that we, uh, we are going to consider TV station as a two-sided platform because uh, they provide two services, uh, TV show to viewers and advertising slot to advertiser. And the real question uh, uh, is, of course, to evaluate uh, the, the sign and the magnitude of the network externality uh, between uh, these uh, two uh, types of uh, customers. Uh, uh, one uh, important difficulty uh, here is that advertisers uh, practice uh, a multi homing strategy. That is to say, uh, uh, there are different, we can think about that in, in a different way, but uh, the idea is uh, the objective of advertising is uh, to minimize the cost of advertising campaign by choosing the mix of TV channel where they are going to put uh, their, uh, their uh, um, uh, uh, advertising uh, 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 slot uh, ads. Uh, so, uh, so, and we have to address this, uh, this, important, uh, this important question. Uh, that has not been uh, very much studied, in fact, uh, on an empirical part in the, in the literature. Uh, an, import, an important aspect also is uh, uh, the type of uh, competition that are uh, between TV ch uh, channels. Uh, uh, we, we believe, and in fact, we state, tested it also, is that the Kurno uh, behavior is uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the most uh, realistic uh, concept to, to represent the competition between them because, in, in fact, uh, TV programming is, is defined maybe uh, uh, months before, and then the advertising sales house determines the supply of advertising slots. They, they need to take into account some regulation uh, imposed by the French law, uh, and, of, and they take into account the sensitivity of, uh, of viewers to advertising. So, uh, so the, the, really, it's, it's not a to our point of view, it's not a competition in price, but a really in competition in, in terms of, uh, of uh, quantity. And the Corno behavior uh, works uh, very well. Uh, uh, we, we, we did it. We did test on, on that uh, in uh, in the paper. Okay, so to, sorry. Can you wrap up in one minute? Okay, so uh, uh, the model is very uh, simple. <laughs> there is a demand model estimated by a nested logic model for the for the viewers. Uh, we uh, estimate the the demand of uh, advertiser using a translog cost uh, uh, function. Uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, we are able by this way to, to analyze uh, the substitution between TV channel from the point of view of viewers and the point of view of uh, advertiser. And then uh, we are able uh, to use the, uh, our estimation of demand uh, to, uh, to analyze uh, the, the, uh, the equilibrium uh, uh, between the TV channel. So uh, here I put the equation. As you can see, the price cost margin of a TV channel uh, is uh, it, very complex. It does not only depend on the demand elasticity in terms of price, but because here there is no uh, uh, there is no price to to uh, to access a, t a TV show. So, but we have to take into account the effect of advertising on the price of advertising, the effect on the viewer. Uh, 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 number of viewers on a viewership uh, uh, globally and how advertising affect uh, uh, view, uh, viewership. So the solution of the equilibrium is uh, quite, uh, com uh, quite complex. Uh, uh, so uh, given that I don't have too much time, what is interesting is that we have simulated, we have observed uh, the equilibrium post-merger post under the remedy of, of, the, of the French authority, which was as you remember, to, to keep separated the advertising sales house. And we have simulated the merger without remedy. Okay? Uh, in both cases, uh, the consumer surplus uh, decreases. Uh, so it means that the decision has not been uh, uh, right. If the objective of uh, uh, the authority is to, uh, to preserve uh, the uh, consumer surplus on the side of viewers, uh, then uh, the decision has, has fell. Uh, moreover, uh, the, if they did not have uh, uh, imposed the remedy, uh, the profit of TF1 will have increased. What it is interesting here is that, in fact, the decision has affected uh, the, the other party uh, uh, of, the, of the market, and in particular has increased uh, the profit of the other TV uh, uh, TV uh, ch channel. So, uh, so, so to conclude uh, rapidly, uh, on the uh, is uh, two three conclusion on the basis of consumer surplus, uh, the merger should not have been approved. On the basis of the welfare analysis, the effectiveness of the remedy can be uh, discussed. And the main lesson is that uh, it's very important to take into account the two sides of uh, platform, uh, otherwise uh, we obtain uh, uh, results that are not, not really expected. Thank you very much.